17 and verse 8 says this. 1 Kings 17 chapter and verse 8. It says this in verse 8. It says, then the word of the Lord came to him. Him being the man of God named Elijah. In verse 9 he says, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. Now, I have a few problems with this scripture because he tells him to go to a place. And then when he gets there, he says, I've commanded a widow to feed you. And I have a problem with that because this woman being a widow means that she already doesn't have a lot. So she's already without an income. And now you're going to ask someone who doesn't have anything to give me something. Have you ever been asked by someone to do something for them and you barely had what you needed to survive? This is what the situation, I had a problem with that. I said, you're going to ask a widow to do something. And verse 10 says, so he arose, went to Zarephath, and when he came to the city, or the gate of the city, as the word of the Lord says, and he called her and said, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Give me a water, give me some water that I might drink. And then as she was going to bring it, he called her and said, in other words, one more thing, bring me a morsel uh, of bread in your hand. So you're already a widow, you don't have anything going on in your life. Your well, your husband or your one source of income is gone. Now you're going out there gathering sticks. He says, bring me some water. While she started to go in the direction to give him water, then he says, while you're at it, bring me some bread. Verse 12 says, and sometimes people ask you, how you doing? You're like, I'm blessed, but that's really not the truth. You really want to tell them the real truth is this. The real truth is, it's, as the Lord God lives, this is the real truth, man of God. I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a drug. And I am now gathering a couple of sticks that I might go in and prepare for myself and my son that we may eat and die. While you ask me to bless you, I'm preparing for my last meal. I'm preparing for my last supper. That's, look at someone say, it's real hard right here. It's real hard. It's real hard. Verse 14 says, for thus says the Lord. But he says, this is what I love. Verse 13 says, and Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said. Where do they do that at? Where does someone tell you I'm getting ready to die? And you say, go ahead and do that. See, y'all read this like, y'all. I'm trying to make it make sense to you. He basically said, or he didn't, he didn't say, don't go, do, don't, don't go kill yourself. He says, don't go eat your last meal. He says, you know, go ahead and do as you plan to do. He said, but first, someone say, but first, but first, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterwards, make something for yourself and your son. For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel. I love it when the Lord says something in the middle of what I plan to do. I wish I had some type of church in here where the Lord interrupts what you plan to do. Has the Lord ever interrupted what you plan to do? Verse 14 says, For thus saith the Lord the God, the jar of the flour shall not be spent, the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. Verse 15 says, And she went, and she did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. Verse 16 and the jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to what? According to what? According to what? According to the word of the Lord that he spoke to Elijah, spoke by Elijah. I want you to do me a favor, tell three people these words. Say, hey, it may get better before it gets worse. Tell three people that. Tell three people that it may get better before it gets worse. All right. Now, I need you to be a believing church. If y'all going to be a dry room, it's going to make it very hard for me to preach this. But I need you to tell somebody again, it may get better before it gets worse. If you really grab that word, I wouldn't have to say another word for the next 30 minutes. If you really grab it, that, that one line should run through your whole spirit. Because what we normally say is it might get worse before it gets better. And that's what you thought the person said to you, but that's not what they said. So that's what we normally say. It might get worse before it gets better. And we settle there, but that's not what the word of the Lord said. That's what your family said. And that's what your neighborhood said. And that's what social media said, but that's not what God says. Now do me a favor, tell somebody again, tell them God says, 
Now say it right, say God says it may get better before it gets worse. Say God said that, not the world. God said that. Father, bless your word, bless your people, God. Open our ears that we might hear and our hearts that we might receive. Change us to reverse that sentence. Put you first and let the rest follow you. We honor you and glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Tell somebody again, it may get better before it gets worse. It may get better. That's good, Darius. Thank you. That's good. It may get better. It may get better. It may get better. I want you to receive that, whoever needs to hear that. I don't even want to move off of that. I want you to receive that and let that resonate within you that you might see better before it gets worse. You might see better before it gets worse. I don't know if anybody's in a bad situation right now, anybody's in a hard situation, whatever it might be. But I want to tell you, you might see something good before you see something bad. And I want you to receive that. Tell somebody he's going to do a reverse. Tell somebody he's going to do a reverse. He's going to do the absolute opposite of what you are prepared for. When we look at this and we look at this scripture, before we get into this particular text in First uh, Kings, uh, last week I was talking about Elijah and now I want to talk about Elijah, which was his spiritual mentor, his spiritual father. And I talked to you about that last week. For those of you who can go on YouTube, you can find that particular uh, message. But as we look um, in the beginning, according to um, Genesis, we always had a word orchestrating or guiding uh, the the situation or the circumstance or what was going on according to genesis 1 chapter 1 uh, we find that in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth that was in the very beginning someone say in the beginning in the beginning god used words to create in the beginning god used words to create he said in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and the scripture says and the world was out form and darkness there was no form there was no there was only darkness but god spoke and according to what god spoke it became because god spoke uh he could not uh, cause anything to exist outside of him what wasn't first in him god looked at what was outside of him which was darkness and said i don't like what's outside of me so let me create what's in me outside of me he created someone say he created god spoke god spoke i want i want i want to get past that god spoke and what god spoke he created then it says that then man spoke and according to what man spoke, it became what man spoke. How do you know this? Because in Genesis, the first chapter, in verse 26, it says, And then God created man, and he made him in his image. That means that whatever man started to speak, it was only God speaking through him because God made man in his image. That means that God could only speak what God had said. So God spoke, and he created, and then he created man, and then man spoke, and he was in alignment with God. Someone say alignment. He was in alignment with God, and according to what man said, said he was only in alignment with God when every animal that you see man named that and everything that man named God said that's good so if you see a dog a man man named that so God gave us all the creative nature to be able to create something happy birthday Miss Sheila I'm sorry I forgot to say that earlier happy birthday Miss Sheila say happy birthday to Miss Sheila yeah I forgot to say that um, so here it is that man created according to God because he was connected to God he was connected to God it's very important that you stay connected to God because anything outside of God is illegal but here it is he spoke according to being connected to God God spoke God created man God created man and then man spoke and everything that man spoke was because God created it he created that nature inside of him then we find in Genesis the third chapter where it says and the enemy was more subtle than any other creature in the field and then the enemy started speaking and when the enemy started speaking he said did God really say did did question I want to see how much of what you've been saying you really believe did God really say that you shall not eat of all of the trees in this particular garden? And then the, they start to have a dialogue and a conversation with the enemy. You should not entertain conversations with the enemy. You should not be sitting there going back and forth with an enemy because the enemy has only designed is to plant a seed in you to throw you off. That's the only design of the enemy, to throw you off. Tell somebody, I will not be thrown off. I will not be thrown off. That is the only thing. That's why scripture says in John 10 that the enemy 
enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, to throw you off, to plant a seed. And that's what happened to many things in the garden. Why would he plant a seed? Because it was a garden. A garden is designed for seeds to be planted. So there's what happens in your mind. It is a place for seeds to be planted because your mind is a garden of which here it is that the enemy plants a seed to germinate because once the seed is planted, then it starts to grow. I want you to ask somebody, what's growing in you? What thought was growing in you? So here it is, the enemy planted a seed and that seed was designed to germinate and to grow. And what did it do? It caused man to doubt. He said, did God really say that you should not be able to eat of any of the trees in this garden? And the, they started to respond and they said, well, God uh, didn't. He, well, I, I think, well, God, well, he said, well, what I thought he said. And he was like, well, yeah, so uh, God, well, I mean. Well, I don't know. And that's how some of you sound when somebody asks you about scripture. Well, I, I think I'm not really sure. Well, what? You know, I mean, God, well, I don't know. Well, uh, 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 tick, uh, well, well, Facebook, well, uh, Instagram, well, I, I don't snap. Uh, I, well, uh, what God, he, he said, well, I, uh, well, my mama, daddy, well, uh, social media, well, uh, come on, well, um, uh, politics, well, um, black, well, white, well, Hispanic, uh, well, uh, uh, I, I'm not really sure what God says, so he sees that there's a hint of doubt in you. As soon as the enemy sees an opening, the enemy's got you. And as soon as the enemy saw, uh, as soon as the enemy saw an opening, all of a sudden, the enemy said, you won't surely die if you partake of what God said not to. So if scripture then says, and that man... Um, and I know you want to say Eve. I don't want to talk about Eve. I want to talk about you. Then mankind, Eve was the mother of mankind. All of a sudden, we, someone say we, we saw that it was desirable. First John says that the enemy comes and the, and the only way he comes is the pride of life, the lust of the flesh. Being able to see something, you see something, you grab it, and what you see grabs you. He says, and as soon as he saw, mankind saw that it was desirable and it was something good, he partook of it. And as soon as he partook of it, he says, oh, we didn't die, which means it did not kill us immediately. Because sin never kills you immediately. It's always gradual. All of a sudden they ate and they said nothing happened. But as soon as they did, what they did notice is that all of a sudden they started to be aware of themselves. God never designed them to be walking around judging themselves. He, he designed them to be in fellowship with him. And all of a sudden man became judgmental of himself. God was not the first person that was judging you. You were the first person judging you. How do I know this? Because God started walking in the garden like he always does. In fellowship like he always does. And all what did man do? Hid. He says, why are you hiding? Because I saw myself. I saw that I had messed up. I saw that I had did something wrong. And I thought that based on what I had done wrong, you didn't want to be in fellowship with him anymore. He said, why did you believe the devil? The devil is a liar. Yay. Why did you start to believe the devil? Why do you start to believe him doing and lying to you like that? You believed the devil and you hid from me. I never told you to hide from me. I knew you were naked when I made you. And I was in fellowship with you. I knew your propensities when I made you. But I was still in fellowship with you. I knew what you would do and I was still in fellowship with you. I knew how you would do it and I was still in fellowship with you. But you allowed the devil to come and plant a seed in you. And I did not plant that seed that the devil placed inside of you so now you are doubting something that I never said to you you were designed for fellowship you were designed to be connected with me you are designed to only listen to my word but now all of a sudden the words that I have spoken to you you doubt from Genesis, the third chapter, all the way to 2024 today, we are still doubting what God said. It's been a fight just from one subtle entrance point. 
from one spot, I went from fellowship to failure. I went from believing to doubting. And from that moment to this moment, we are still asking, did God really say? From that moment for this moment, we're still asking ourselves, is the Bible really true? Is it really right? Did God really say? And our doubting is keeping us from fellowship. Our doubting is keeping us from communion. Our doubting is keeping us from worshiping. Our doubting is keeping us from praying. My doubting is keeping me from giving. My doubting is keeping me from forgiving. My doubting is keeping me from going into places that God designed for me to be in because I let one interest point allow me to doubt the entire intent of God's relationship. Genesis 1 and 26, and I made you in my image. And now we believe the image of everybody else but the image of the maker who made me. All these years, and we're still doubting, did God make a mistake about me? Did God really make me this way? Does God really love me? Does God really want me to be blessed? Does God really have a plan for me? Does God really want me to do better than I've ever seen? Does God really want me to break generational curses? Does God really say no weapon formed against me shall prosper because it seems like everything is prospering? Did God really say that? Did God really say joy comes in the morning because I have seen no joy in the morning or joy? Did God really say that? So I am questioning the very intent of what God said. And I hear the preacher. I'm trying to hear him, but I can't hear him because I've heard everything that I've heard all week long. I have seen things. I have tweeted things. I have seen things in my text thread and everything. And everything outside of this room is speaking louder than the few moments I have in this room. And I am doubting if God's word is really true because I have never seen God's word work. I have never seen God's work move. I've never seen God really do anything that's substantial. I've heard about him, but I haven't seen anything. Is it really real? Is God really real? Is the church really real? Is the preacher really real? Is the Bible really real? Do I really worship? Does it really mean anything? Does anything really happen all these years I keep doubting and I'm saved go to church but I'm still doubt go to church every time it's open and I'm still doubting is it really real any of it real so in the beginning God created and he said it was good in the beginning, man created because he was in sync with God, and it was good. The enemy came in, and ever since then, we're asking, was it ever really good anyway? And we look at this scripture, and we find this First Kings. Here it is, the back end, before we get to chapter, uh, verse 1 of chapter 17, we find that there was a king named Ahab. This king was an evil king, and this evil king had married a lady by the name of Jezebel. And he started to create an alliance that was going against God's people. Now, I want to sweep around that just for those of you who have inappropriately called somebody Jezebel. Unappropriately think that someone is a Jezebel because of how they dress. Unappropriately think that someone is Jezebel because of uh, their makeup or, or whatever. And you think, unfortunately, for those of us who unlearn, that Jezebel means woman. You believe that Jezebel is regulated to female. You think Jezebel is regulated to sexual. You think Jezebel is regulated to someone who steals someone's husband or someone else's man and and that's what we say a Jezebel is, and we call and we judge people, but that's not what Jezebel is. A real Jezebel is someone who attaches themselves to power. A real Jezebel is someone who attaches themselves to the most influ influential person in the room, the most influential person in the organization, the most influential, the highest echelons of, of, of success and the highest echelons of, of order. They will attach themselves to someone only for the, for the secret motive of influencing them to influence you. 
Uh, Jezebel is never seen. Jezebel is usually just attached. They are the one who whispers in your ear when no one else is around. And, and you made one decision and all, it's quiet in this church. You, you made one decision and all of a sudden you change your decision and they wonder why you change your decision. It's because you might be connected to a Jezebel. It is a spirit more than it is a person. It is a spirit. It is not a person. It is not Susan. It is not James. It is not Jay. It's not a man. It's not a woman. It is a spirit that tries to manipulate and to control and to create confusion amongst the camp. And I come to speak against every Jezebel that's been speaking in your ear, whether it be a friend, whether it be a foe, whether it be somebody texting you, whether it be somebody you are courting, somebody you are dating. It could be your supervisor. It could be your principal. It could be your CEO. Anything that is speaking to you that is trying to create confusion in you and causing you not to operate the way that God will cause you to operate is a Jezebel. And I want somebody to holler out right now, Jezebel's got to go. Somebody say, Jezebel's got to go. And in the midst of that alliance being established, God spoke a word to Elijah. And he said, the word was, there shall be no more rain there should be no more rain in this land until I speak another word. <laughs> there should be no more rain. It shall not des descend. It shall be dry in this land until I come back and speak another word. You can ready to go into a season of drought. Everybody wants the word of God that blesses you. Sometimes the word of the Lord stops you. <laughs> it says sometimes until you get it right, there will be no more rain. <laughs> And you have to ask yourself, the first thing is, what, watch, say this, watch what you say. Tell somebody that, watch what you say. Because Elijah spoke a word, and according to his word, it came to pass. God spoke a word, and according to what God said, it came to pass. The man said a word because God told him to say the word that he said. Anything that God says always comes to pass. So you have to ask yourself, what exactly am I saying? So Elijah spoke a word. He said there were no more rain. There will be no more rain. And that word came to pass in verse 1. As the Lord God of Israel lives, he says there will be no more rain. There won't be anything uh, for these years until I speak another word. Now this is the second part. Watch what you say. Second thing is, watch what God says. Tell somebody, watch what God says. So there was a dry season. I mean, my voice is like this. There was a dry season. It was a barren time. But all of a sudden, God didn't speak. Uh, God didn't speak necessarily anymore to Elijah. But God started to speak to a raven. God didn't speak to Elijah anymore. But he started to speak raven. Tell somebody God speaks raven. See, some of y'all thank God that he speaks to you. I thank God that he can speak to my situation about me. I thank God that he speaks raven. Do you know how to speak raven? I don't know how to speak raven. Do you know how to speak mockingbird? I don't know how to speak mockingbird. Do you know how to speak horse? I don't know how to speak horse. Do you know how to speak moo? Do you know how to speak cow? I don't know how to speak it. Do you know how to speak fish? No, I don't know how to do any of it, but I'm so glad that God can speak to the animals. And I love it that God can speak to the animals and the animals can come take care of me. God spoke to the raven and the raven all of a sudden, because a raven, according to Brandon, according to the ravens, it says that a raven will only feed you if the raven has been trained to feed you. I'm so glad that, I, that even though the prophet couldn't train the raven, but God made the raven and the raven responded to God and God said, go feed my man of God. Tell somebody God will always take care of you. God will always take care of you. He says God sent him to a place. And when God sent him to a place, according to verse 4, he says you shall drink from the brook. And I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. The brook is not a river. A brook is not a lake. A brook is not a stream. A brook is about 10 feet wide. And it is only contingent, the depthness of it, or the design of it, is only contingent upon the rain that fills it. It is not a river. It is not a stream. It is not a lake. It is not an ocean. It is a, it is a 10 feet wide uh, uh, spot that is only filled 
with what God fills it with according to rain. So the rain had stopped, but the brook was prepared for him before he got there. God already had a spot prepared for the word that had been released. That even though there will be no more rain, I will still take care of you. I don't know who needs to hear that. Even though there is no more rain, even though there is no more things going on around you, I will always have a spot for you. Can we pause for the cause and give God praise for the spots that he designed just for me? Everybody else might not have a spot, but I got a spot. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the son of God discloses and he walks with me and I wish I had a church that can and thank God for the spots that he created. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I want to thank God for my spot. Designed a spot for me that didn't make sense. How is it there's no rain in the land, but I got rain taking care of me? How is there no provision anywhere outside of me, but ravens are taking care of me? I don't have no friends, but I got a raven. I ain't got nobody texting me, but I got a raven. Can you thank God for unlikely blessings, things that you didn't even see coming, places out of spots you would have never imagined, but all of a sudden, God sent a raven, somebody you ain't talked to for 15 years, somebody you hadn't heard from in a long time, and all of a sudden, somebody said, what's your cash app? I just feel led to feed you in this season. Can we take a moment to thank God for the ravens that take care of you in your spot. Ravens are known for problem solving skills. Ravens don't just take food. They are critical thinkers. Don't ever overlook a raven because it's dark. Don't overlook a raven because it's hard to see them in the light. Don't overlook me because I might look dark to you. But underneath all of this melanin, underneath all of this darkness, there is a critical thinking brain inside of me. I have learned how to problem solve. Can you thank God for a moment that there's something inside of you that other people overlook? There's something inside of you that they can't nobody appreciate. Matter of fact, take a moment and appreciate yourself. You and your smart self. Your, your <laughs> Ravens are intelligent. This rain, this, this raven, in the midst of his dark, dry season, said, I'm going to feed you. And never in the scripture did we see that the man of God complained about what fed him. Some of us cannot be fed by God because we don't like who God sent to feed us. So it is not that God's not blessing you. We don't like how the blessing came packaged. So we're sitting here saying, I'm waiting on God. God said, you ain't waiting on me. I sent it to you. I've already shown you. You just don't like that person or you don't like that avenue. But Hezekiah Walker said, anyway, you bless me. I'll be satisfied. Because somebody said, I just want him to bless me anyway, 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 anyway. Watch what you say. Watch what God says. Next thing is, watch what you say about your situation. It says, after a while, the brook dried up and there was no rain. Hear this meaning. God provided, hallelujah, God provided rain, prepared it for him in the brook. But eventually, that resource dried up because it was contingent on rain. Eventually, it ran. Eventually, the government couldn't pay for him anymore. Eventually, it ran out. But just because it ran out didn't mean God did. 
after that, it says God gave him another word. Someone say, God gave him another word, another word. God gave him another word and said, go down to visit Zarephath and go visit a widow. She has what you need. Now, you already fed me by a raven, an unlikely source. Now you're going to send me to an unlikely person, a widow who's already in a bad situation. Why would you send me to somebody who's got a bad situation? Why would the blessing be in the house of somebody who's going through worse than what I'm going through? Why would you send me to somebody who is, according to just her resume, doesn't seem to be in a position to give me anything. I want to talk for a moment to some people in here that according to your resume, you are not qualified. According to your background, there is no reason that you should be in the positions of which you are in right now. According to how things panned out, there is no reason Raven, that you should have survived. There is absolutely no reason why you should have not been in a room with padded walls. There is no reason. But I'm so glad that God doesn't look at resumes. So glad. God didn't look at my zip code when he decided to bless me. I'm so, so glad that God didn't judge me according to my last name. I, I'm just so glad that he, the songwriter said, he looked beyond my faults, <laughs> saw my needs. Can, can we give God a praise just for a moment that he looked beyond you and still said, I want to use you. <laughs> but Dickens Light, I'm trying to unpack this the best I can, is that God spoke to him about the situation and I can't, I can't rush back that because all of these examples I've given you were connected to God speaking. I want to drive this because if God is speaking, the question for us is, but are you listening? Because a part of being a prophet is being a listener. An untalked about part of prayer is listening. If all you're doing is talking all the time, when do you hear God speak? And if all you do is talk a lot, I got to tell God all about it. If you've been telling God all about it, have you ever listened to see what God has to say about it? Because the most uncomfortable part of prayer you will experience it's when you don't say nothing. But you can't be silent if you're in a rush to get out of it. Silence is not going into a room and saying, Holy Father, it's been five days since I've talked to you and talking to somebody that you don't see. Prayer is, God, I tell you what I need. I tell you what's going on with me. I worship you. And then I hear what you have to say about it. And sometimes the loudest answer is no answer. I'm trying to help somebody this morning. Sometimes God speaks silence. And when God doesn't speak, you don't move. Come on here. When God don't speak, you don't say nothing. I know you had planned your cuss words for the week. But if God tells you to shut your mouth, you shut your mouth. You don't say nothing until God tells you to say it. God says vengeance is mine, but we think vengeance is mine. But vengeance ain't mine. Vengeance is God. And you've got to listen to hear what God's play is. Tell somebody around you, be quiet for a moment. Psalms 46 and 10 says, be still. Everybody's in a hurry. Be still. 24 hours in our house, our power is out. My dearest son, my youngest son, have two of them. One's back there. The youngest one just got through singing. He said, when our power was out, he said, I start praying. I said, God probably said, who's that? It was just a joke. <laughs> he prayed. He was praying, and I said, what did you pray? He said, five times I said, 
as I watched my phone die. He was sad. He said, my, my phone died. I said, what time did it die? 9.27. I watched it die. I said, what did you do after that? He said, from 9 to 1. I just looked at the candle. I said, what'd you do? He said, I prayed. I asked God five times. I said, please turn the lights back on. I said, Miles, what did God say? Go to sleep, son. <laughs> Could God be trying to knock some of your power out just so you can be still? When you can't connect to Wi-Fi, can you still get on your knees? When you can't see nothing, can you still see God? When nobody else is connected, can you still stay connected to the source? Sometimes God will shut it all down to shut you down. I'm not making light of the situation. I'm saying there are seasons when scripture says in Psalm 23, Pastor Brandon, he says, he maketh me lie down. Why does he make me lie down, Jelante? It's because I won't lie down. So he makes me lie down. Where? In green pastures. He makes me lay, lie down just so I can feed. How is it that I'm hungry, but I won't lay down to get nourishment? That's because we are such in a hurry that we would drive on empty and still pull it over for a moment just to get refilled. Tell somebody, I need a refill. Tell somebody, I need a refill. But if you are always moving and always going, what is it that God has to shut down just to get your attention? The brook dried up, meaning there was no more help there. It is very difficult for us when Jesus allows our Lazarus to die. It's very difficult for us when we ask for healing and instead of him healing, he takes them. It is very difficult for us when I carried the baby for five months and the baby did not come full term. It is very difficult for me when I knew I was qualified for the job and they chose the person less qualified instead of me. It's very difficult for me when the brook dries up. But just because your brook dries up doesn't mean that the earth is still not the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the world and they that dwell there. I want to preach this Bible until somebody understands that your brook may have dried up, but God ain't finished. Tell somebody God is not finished. He tells him, go over to a woman. I'm sending you to her. Because this situation is more about her than it is about you. She's already in a situation. You're in a temporary moment. I'm sending you to her because her response is going to determine what happens to her next. You're a man of God. You're hired by me. But you aren't going to speak the word to the woman who's going to have to respond to the word. And the way that she responds to the word will determine how I respond to her. Your next moment might be how you respond to this moment. Your next thing might be based on how you respond right now. I'm not talking about this church service. I'm talking about in your dried up brook season. In the season where nothing is going on and nothing is happening for you, how are you responding to God right now? He sent her to the house. He gets to the house. He says to the woman, he says, the Lord sent me here. He sent me here because you have something I need. Paraphrasing this, Mario version, Mario standard version. He says, you have something I need. She says, go ahead. He says, uh, I see you gathering sticks here. Um, that's nice. Um, I need some water. She says, all right, I can go get you some water. She starts to go in the direction of water. He says, and while you're at it, I need some bread. I can imagine, Mill, 
I just believe, I'm sorry, just excuse me, it's no offense. I just believe this woman uh, was um, melanated. I, I just believe it because her response tells me that. She didn't say, well, you know, um, about that water, you know, I, I would like to give you water. Um, what's your name? Oh, Elijah. Yeah, Elijah. I would like to give you water, but, um, you know, I'm, um, uh, you know, having a hard time right now, you know. Uh, me and little, you know, little Jacob here, you know, we, um, we, um, we're just going to gather some sticks and, you know, and we're going to, um, we're going to go in there and we're going to make a little cake, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I just can't do that right now. But that's not what she said. This woman, in the middle of going to get him some water, and then he added something. She says, <laughs> man of God. <laughs> I heard the first request. I got that. I was already doing something when you got here, man of God. Um, and then you asked me to go get you some water. <laughs> I'm respecting that you call yourself a man of God. I don't know you. I just met you. And um, <laughs> you want me to get you some water <laughs> and some bread. <laughs> uh, get somebody else to do it. Uh, because what we were going to do is I was going to make this, gather these sticks, go into the house. And me and my son, uh, we were planning to uh, unlife ourselves. We were planning to, to, to die. That, we, we, that's the plan. So, <laughs> uh-uh. I can't do it. I'm, I'm just sorry. Don't y'all see her attitude? Have you ever been mad at God's request? Had God ever asked you to do something and you weren't exactly excited about it? I wish I had somebody real in here. I know y'all, the church people showed up on the 1030 service. I, I mean, have you ever, God asked you to forgive somebody and you... I like about that, God. <laughs> why do I always have to be the bigger person? Why, why, why do I all, come on somebody, I'm trying to help you. Why, why do I always have to be the first person to text? Why, why do I always have to be the person to call them? Why don't they ever call me? Because you're the man of God. Because you're the woman of God. Oh God, help me, Jesus Christ. I, I want you to high five a few people, tell them, you the one, 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 you the one. You waiting, because hear this, hear this, Celia, because this is why I know, Brandon, that she wasn't a woman of God. Because she said, as your God. So how you expect somebody who don't have God to act godly? Now, I know some of you say, well, they in church. Just because they in church don't mean they got God. There's a whole bunch of people who do the work. Scripture says it in, in Matthew. He says, did I not cry, Lord, Lord? Did I not do many works? Did I not do many things? He said, but I never knew you. There's a lot of people who claim him but don't know him. She says, as your God lives... So I don't, I don't know your God. He responded to her in full God fashion. Did not say, I understand. It is hard out here in these streets. I get it. You're going through a difficult season. It's all right. I'll find somebody else. God never changes his mind about his request. Your season does not shift God's perspective. Whatever God said... That's what God means. And I know we're in a season where we try to alter and change what God says. But whatever God said is what God said. We used to say a long time in the church, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Whether and I want to amend that, whether you believe it or not, God still said it, and that is still settled. That is what God said. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not one jot or one tittle will pass from his word. Someone say, his word is what he said. The man of God responds to her. I'm almost a Marian. The man of God responds to her, and he says, go do that. You plan to unlife yourself? You, you, you plan to do it? Go do that. 
But first, do what God asks you to do. But first, do what I'm asking you to do. I know you got a plan, but seek first. I know you're planning. You're, you're planning for the worst. You already got it scripted out. Some of y'all, you upset right now because God is ripping your script. You already got it planned out. You already knew. Some of y'all, this new update on your phone, you have already scheduled the text message to send at a certain time. I love it in emails. It says draft. Some of you need to go in your drafts and delete it. Y'all like. He says, I know you got a plan. Prepare for your plan, but follow this first. Seek ye first the kingdom means, I know I have my way, but let me check my way with God's way first. I know I got a plan, but what is it that God wants me to do first? This is what I intend to do, but what does God say first? And if there's anything that the enemy is fighting the church about today, it's did God really say that? <laughs> did God really tell you to put him first? Do I pay my bills or do I pay God first? This tithing thing, this giving thing, this, this whole, y'all thought I was just talking about like, I'm not, this is a giving scripture. This is a giving thing. This whole thing about giving. Do I net gross? What, what, exactly, exactly what I do. Got quiet. Because the first is coming and I got a plan to pay that and prepare to struggle for the rest of the month. I got a plan to pay the rent, the mortgage, the car note. The, 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 I, got a, I got a plan to pay all that. And my plan is to then go struggle with my family for the rest of October. My plan is not to give at church today. I had no intentions to do that. The offer is coming. I have no intention to participate in that. I have no intention of giving you nothing. My intention is to pay everything else first and struggle as the widow I am. All I know is struggle. So I plan to have another month to struggle like I did in September. That's my plan. To, to, to struggle and to, to go through and, and to be hard, have a hard shift. It's getting real tense in this church. The more I talk about giving, as long as I was talking about the brook, yes, yes, yeah. But as soon as I start talking about giving, er, because my plan was to skip that, to skip the God part. I, had, I didn't plan for that. I plan to get my little scripture, get my little sermon, get my little 1030 service, go to brunch, go ahead and do what I got to do and, and, and come back next Sunday and do the same thing again. But all of a sudden you sent this man of God in the middle of me gathering debt. Because sticks are not connected to a branch. So I'm sitting here in my yard gathering debt, gathering stuff that has no life, preparing to take death in my house so we can live together. That's my plan. The man of God says, prepare for that. That's good. That's what you always do. That's what you know to do. I'm asking you to do something you don't know to do. I'm asking you to do something that's going to be a heart thing. Sometimes heart things are hard things. 
Sometimes hard things are hard things because where your treasure is, there is your heart. And sometimes giving is a hard thing because it's a heart thing. Giving, tithing, giving, offering, all that stuff, serving, doing things for other people, forgiving, loving people, reconciliation, being kind, being nice. It's a hard thing because it's really. And as a man thinks in his heart, stingy in my heart, stingy in my giving. <laughs> Tell somebody it's a heart thing. It's not, it's, not, it, it, it's not a giving thing. It's not a tithing thing. It's not a net thing. It's not a gross thing. It's not a church thing. It's not a growth point thing. It's not a pastor thing. It's a heart thing. That's why the Bible says, let no man give grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. That means that every man decide what he has already purposed to give. That means I got to make a decision in my heart that above all things, I'm going to seek God first. It's a heart thing. Tell somebody it's a heart thing. I know a lot of you all having a hard time because you're like, man, that means I got to give today? No. Because if it's hard for you, God would rather you not. He don't want your money. He wants your heart. Because if he has your heart, he'll always have your money. But if he can't have your heart, he'll never have your wallet. He'll never have your cash app. He'll never have your Venmo. He'll never have it because he don't have your heart. Giving is a heart thing. But if you're in a hard season, he'll never have your heart. So the woman responds and he says to her, I'm almost through. Y'all can't take much more. He said to her, he says, give. Give to me first. He says, and after that, if you do, if, someone say if. If you seek him first, all these things will be, oh, y'all didn't see that in the scripture? Oh, y'all didn't see that. Oh, man, let me point it out. Y'all didn't see it. Y'all didn't see it. Put on the scripture. I don't know if they got that. I don't got it. He says, so he went. Uh, where, where, where is it at? Let me find it. Let me find it. Verse 13. Verse, put verse 13 up there. He says, do not fear. Go and do as you said. But first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterwards, make something for yourself and your son. Verse, four, verse 14 says, for thus saith the Lord. Could it be that God can't speak because you can't give? You give, I'll speak. You position yourself kingdom way, I'll respond like a king. You can't have a kingdom blessing if you won't listen to the king. You can't be a kingdom man, not submitted to the king. You can't be a kingdom woman, not submitted to the king. Someone say, I submit to the king. Y'all talking about taking me to the king? You don't know the king. You got to know the king to be able to know the king's ways. And the king's ways are not my ways. And he responds and he goes in verse, in verse 14 says, For thus saith the king, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spit and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. In other words, Deacon Sterling, he says, I know there is a drought in the land, but I will take care of you as long as there is a drought in the land. As long as the economy is going into recession, as long as things are going on, I will take care of you. If you seek me first, I will make sure you never have lack in your life. You will never have to judge. You will never have to beg. You will never have to be doubt. You will never have to be without. I will take care of you. In the old church, they would say, if you take care of God's house, God will take care of your house. Tell somebody, God will take care of your house. God, God will take care of your house. I feel like the old church it says be not dismayed I'm sorry y'all I'm sorry it says be not dismayed 
would ever be tied God will take care of you we high five somebody say he will take care of you he, he will take care of you y'all ain't telling the right person some of y'all are going through some hard seasons and some hard times but some of y'all need to hear the word of the Lord the word of the Lord is God will take care of you I didn't say my word the word of the Lord is he will take care of you he says you won't lack you won't go through you won't go through like they go through I'll make sure you have what you have and verse 15 says and she went and did as the man of God said and she and he and her household ate for many days well Kareen I said well who's he because she's a widow I thought she didn't have nobody she said I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna make sure that me and my son die but when the word I'm, I'm through me you don't have to leave me he says when the word came forth it says and she did exactly what he said and she and he and her household ate for many days which means I know you only had enough for you and your son but you got cousins in your house too you got neighbors in your house too <laughs> because sometimes when you're going through your own thing you're taking care of somebody else who's going through that thing too <laughs> he says but when you do it my way I'll make your cup run over I'll make sure you don't just have enough for your son I'll give you enough for Pookie Nim I'll give you enough for Susan I'll give you enough for Shanene I'll give you enough for everybody tell somebody he's gonna give you enough 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 the way you need yourself. I want to thank God for the times he gave me more than enough. Because some of y'all, y'all are only used to the blessing that is just enough. But God is going to give you into a season that you're going to have more than enough. Not just enough, but more than enough. Tell somebody I'm going to have more than enough. More joy, more strength, more prayer, more power. He's going to give me more than enough. Somebody say, oh, Gotta get out of that. I gotta get out of that. He'll give you more. Verse 16 says, And the jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty. Here's the part. Says Anita, according to the word of the Lord. Did God say it? Yes, he did. <laughs> Will you tell somebody? He said it. 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 Here's my last few things. Got to get out of here. And here's your takeaway. <laughs> Hear the word of the Lord to you. Heed the word about you. Heed means pay attention to it. And the last thing is, have what the word says for you. If the word says it, I can have it. If the word says I'm the head and not the tail, that means that's what I'll be. If the word says I'll live in houses I did not build, that's what the word says. If the word says with long life he'll satisfy me, that's what the word says. If the word says weeping may endure for a night, joy comes in the morning, that's what I will see. Tell somebody I will see what he says. Whatever God says, I'll see it. My last thing, I don't know if y'all can put that on the screen because I never got to it, but I want to say this for everybody. Everybody standing. I'm through. God can speak your situation to your solution. Say it one more time. God can speak your situation to your solution. You want word for it? 
God spoke to a raven about Elijah's situation and the raven was his solution. God spoke to the man about the widow and that was her solution. God spoke to the woman about what God spoke to her and that was her solution. Just because you don't see it don't mean God ain't speaking. I don't care what situation anybody in this room is in. I don't care what it is. I don't care how dry your season is. When God speaks, things happen. When I speak, I can't say things happen all the time. But when I say what God says, Scripture says he's given him a name that above every, that at, at the name, at the very mention of his name, everything has to submit because God said it. This week, church, your assignment, be quiet long enough to hear what God is saying because you've been talking about your brook for a long time. You've already been talking about your situation. I already know it. You know it. Everybody knows it. When they call you, how you doing, girl? We know. We already know. We got it. It's hard. Life is life. We got it. Can you be quiet long enough to hear, but God still be God? Can you be quiet enough to be able to say, before it gets better, it gets worse? That's what we say. Can you reverse? Because God says, before it gets worse, it might just get better. Can you close your eyes for a moment, lift your hands? Can you imagine better for you? Imagine it. Just this week, imagine what would better look like for you.